Hello and welcome to The Bazooka, Season 1, Episode 3. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. These are a series on my YouTube channel that are focused on uh, looking at 10 OSCE stations in one clinical course. And just like with the surgery presentation, I have to warn you that some images in here uh, are pretty graphic. So if you're not used to that, take weary of that and note that all the images that are contained in this presentation are only for teaching purposes and any resemblance is only by coincidence. So we shall begin with station one. Again, feel free to pause the video. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, drop a comment, drop a like, show some support and thank you in advance. So question one, study the image and answer the following questions. So the first question is mention at least three features you notice. The second question is what is the diagnosis? The third question is mention one risk factor for this condition. The fourth question is mention any three other associated problems. So you could pause the video right now. And if you haven't yet gotten a paper to write these things down, I don't know if I have to tell you every single video, please get a paper and write these things down. It is going to be easier for you to remember if you participate in this actively rather than passively and just waiting for me to give you the answer. So I'm going to give you the answer right now. So uh, as we can see from this image here, this child has epicanthal folds and this what appears to be a flat nasal bridge. They also have a short neck as well as a low set ears. So this is most likely that this child has Down syndrome or trisomy 21. Then one risk factor for this condition is advancing maternal age. As a woman gets older, especially beyond the age of 35, then there's a much higher chance of her giving birth to a child that has trisomy 21. Then mention three uh, other associated problems. So these children usually have um, some congenital heart disease. They may be born with hypothyroidism. They may be born with learning disabilities. Sometimes they may be, have uh, poor hearing or hearing uh, losses. So they have to constantly go for uh, hearing checkups. Then you may also have duodenal atresia. There may be Hirschsprung's disease. So station two, a two-year-old patient comes to Levi Mwanawasa University Teaching Hospital with a history of passing dark colored urine, fever, and yellowing of the eyes for two days. On admission, she is pale, jaundiced, and has a temperature of 38.8 degrees. Uh, results are as shown. So this is the urine and then um, the slide is also done and this is what is seen. What is the diagnosis? What complication has occurred? What are the possible complications? What other investigations would you do? What is a drug of choice? Again, here is a, a two minute second for you to, uh, or two second interval for you to pause the video. Okay, so most likely this child has severe malaria as we can see, this child has a history of a fever. So whenever someone comes in with a fever, especially in a tropical area, even a fever in an area where malaria is present, then yellowing of the eyes, then you should suspect malaria. And of course, dark urine. So the um, complication that this child has come in with is black water fever. Then what are the possible complications? So you, it's best you know these from head to toe because it makes it very easy to remember. So you have cerebral malaria, which remember is um, having generalized tonic-clonic seizures uh, two or more in 24 hours attributed to no other cause but malaria, or you could define it as an alteration in the level of consciousness attributed to no other cause but malaria. You could also have pulmonary edema, you could have acidosis, you could have disseminated intravascular coagulation. Please do not write abbreviations on your answer. Um, hypoglycemia, severe anemia, algid malaria, that's malaria with shock. Then what other investigations would you do? So I would want to do a complete blood count or a full blood count. Obviously, you, you may see some derangements in the white blood cell count as well as the platelets, as well as the red blood cells for you to detect the anemia. You may also want to do some uh, urea and electrolytes because acute kidney injury is um, a complication as well. You may want to do arterial blood gases to pick up the acidosis and of course your random blood sugar, which may point you towards hypoglycemia. And of course, your 
uh, treatment of choice is atesonate given intravenous. Station three is another image. So please study this image and answer the following questions. What sign can you see? What other signs would you look for? What is the most likely diagnosis? Mention four possible complications of your diagnosis. What is the long-term management? So I'll give you a two second interval. Okay, so looking at this picture here, this child has this um, frontal bossing, as we can see over here, which is very typical in sickle cell uh, patients. So this is most likely that this child has sickle cell anemia. And the other signs that you would look for include pallor, um, because of the hemolysis of the red blood cells, so there may be anemia. Due to hemolysis, you could also have jaundice, you could also have swollen, painful joints that you would often uh, look for. Then mention four possible complications of your diagnosis. So in the internal medicine uh, video on the OSCE stations, I think the last station that we covered was on sickle cell. So for the other complications, I will leave a card right here so please click here if you still haven't watched the internal medicine OSCE video um, so other complications include splenic sequestration sequestration could also happen in um, the liver you could also have a hyperhemolytic crisis you could have a plastic crisis which is infection with parvo the erythroid progenitor cell gets infected with a parvo virus b19 uh, or now was reclassified and is now known as an erythrovirus B19. Then you could also have a vasoclusive crisis. You could also have chronic leg ulcers. And what is the long-term management? So we usually give this patient folate because of this uh, chronic hemolysis that this child is usually undergoing. So these extra medullary hematopoiesis or generally um, red blood cells need to be synthesized uh, in order to prevent very, very severe um, anemia, then you may also want to give them malaria prophylaxis. We usually give them Delta Prim, which is pyrimethamine. And then of course, because these children undergo autosplenectomy, so they are at a higher risk of um, developing uh, infections of encapsulated organisms. And of course, your uh, pneumococcus is an encapsulated organism. So that's why we give this pneumococcal vaccine. And the reason why we give them malaria prophylaxis, despite them not easily getting malaria, well, they are they do not easily get one type of malaria. Remember, there are four main types of malaria, Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium malariae, Plasmodium ovale, and Plasmodium vivax. Now, they are not so susceptible to Plasmodium falciparum, but they could contract these other um, types of malaria. That's why we wanna uh, give them prophylaxis. And when they do get these other types of malaria, it usually tends to be severe. Then station four, study the picture shown here. What do you see? Give four differentials, write down four investigations you would do, list down two complications due to this condition. Again, I will give you a two second interval. So as we can see from this image, we could see that um, obviously the fingertips here are blue. So you call this as a peripheral cyanosis, not just cyanosis, but peripheral cyanosis. And then um, the fingers also looked clubbed. So uh, finger clubbing as well as peripheral cyanosis. Give four differentials. So most commonly that this child may have had uh, a cyanotic congenital heart disease. So it could be tetralogy of Fallot, it could be trancocytriosis, it could be tricuspid atresia, it could be total anomalous pulmonary venous return. There are also other conditions um, that may present you with finger clubbing and cyanosis, things like cystic fibrosis, and um, write down four investigations you would do. So you would want to order a chest x-ray. So you may see an oligemic lung field as well as a boot-shaped heart in case of tetralogy or fallow. You may also want to order a cardiac echo. You also want to do an ECG and of course a full blood count or a complete blood count. Then list down two complications due to this condition. So you could develop some thrombi, which could also possibly embolize. So thromboembolic phenomenon. Then uh, you could also develop endocarditis, ex especially in um, uh, patients who have defects in their heart. Then of course this, this child could die, there could be sudden um, death. Station five, which is halfway. So what are the abnormalities seen in this image? Uh, what is your diagnosis? List five essential steps of care. What advice would you uh, give to 
to this uh, patient's mother to avoid a similar condition in the next sibling. So take some time to look at this picture. You could pause the video. I will give you a two second interval to do that. Okay, so as we can see from this image, uh, looking at um, this child, look at the bottom, these feet look swollen, so there's pedoedema. You could see the distension of the abdomen, most likely it's ascites. You could see that the, the outlines of the ribs are seen very well, so this child is showing some signs of wasting. And of course, on the temporal area here, there is some uh, hair loss, even some discoloration of the hair. So there is a discoloration of the hair as well as uh, temporal uh, balding. Then, of course, your diagnosis would be most likely that this child has severe acute malnutrition, though you'd have to uh, perform some anthropometric measurements uh, to actually quantify this, but that's the most likely diagnosis. Then list five essential steps of care. So you want to treat and prevent hypoglycemia. That's the first thing you want to do. You want to treat and prevent hypothermia. You want to treat and prevent infections. You want to rehydrate this child and correct the electrolyte imbalances, especially with potassium. And then you also want to give this child some micronutrients, such as vitamin A, especially, and of course, institute feeds uh, in a gradual manner. So you start with initial, initial initiation feeds and then um, your catch-up feeds. Then what advice would you give the, mother, the patient's mother to avoid a similar condition in the next sibling? So you advise her nutritional advice, what to feed the child. Um, of course, this may not be practical in some cases because some mothers have a low socioeconomic status. So there's only so much you could advise her to do. But if she is well to do, then obviously um, you would tell her to feed her child much better and uh, increase the nutritional value of uh, the food in the child. Of course, uh, growth monitoring, which is done by taking the child to the under five clinic. Also taking the child to under five clinic to get immunization shots, as well as family planning to space out the children so that they are not really a burden to the parents, given that um, times are really hard, especially in third world countries. So station six is an uh, x-ray of the skull. So study the picture describe the findings and what is your diagnosis so the only two questions here not so much so i'll give you a two second interval okay so as we could see here you could see these spikes that appear as if this skull here has hair so this is obviously due to accentuation of the trabeculae in the um, between the bones or in the bones of the skull because of this extramedullary hematopoiesis um, then this is what is referred to as a hair on end appearance and of course the most likely diagnosis here would be sickle cell anemia or in any case any hemolytic anemia could actually lead to this appearance so in our in our setup the most common cause is sickle cell anemia but any hemolytic anemia could also lead to this appearance so station seven, um, you have three specimens, specimen one, specimen two, and specimen three. So name specimen one, two, three, list two specific clinical features and the disease caused by specimen one and two. Mention one risk factor for specimen two and what is the drug of choice in the treatment of this condition. So again, I shall give you a two second uh, interval. All right, so these are obviously schistosome uh, eggs. So this is schistosome mansoni. This is schistosome hematobium. These two we have uh, locally. This is uh, schistosome japonicum, which we do not have locally. So there's two specific uh, clinical features. So uh, mansoni here uh, causes a disease that's known as intestinal schistosomiasis. Then uh, hematobium here causes uh, schistosomiasis, uh, urinary schistosomiasis or bilharzia. So remember, how do I know this? Um, which is called which? So remember, the T here in hematobium should remind you that the spine is terminal. So T for terminal spine, that's for hematobium. Then mansoni has a lateral spine, japonicum is round, so no spine at all. That's like the weird one of them all. 
then um, so you have intestinal schistosomiasis which may present you as bloody diarrhea you may have ascites or splenomegaly that's only because of the fibrosis that is happening uh, in relation to the liver you may also have urinary schistosomiasis where you have this painless terminal hematuria sometimes you may have frequency so one risk factor for getting a hematobium is of course swimming or walking barefoot in water containing the cecaria, which is one of the life stages of the parasite. And of course, what is the drug of choice in the treatment of the condition is praziquantel. Then station eight only has two questions. So let's study the picture below and um, answer the following questions. What is shown in the picture above on the site? What are the indications of its use? So I'll give you a two second interval. Okay, so this is obviously a nebulizer and a nebulizer could be used in specifically pulmonary conditions. So things like asthma, things like pneumonia, things like cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, atelectasis, and even some bron bronchospasms. You could also use them in uh, COPDs. Those COPDs are not so common in the pediatric um, setup unless maybe it's a child that's born with alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, deficiency but that's also a bit rare in our setup so station 9 which is one classical picture that is always on um, most pediatric exams so study the image shown what is the most likely diagnosis what investigation would you order and what would you see what other investigations would you order how would you treat this child what is the main complication of treatment and associated metabolic disorders how would you prevent this complication so again i'll give you a two second interval to think this through you could pause the video right now So most likely this child has a Burkitt's lymphoma uh, because this is a tumor that's most commonly affects um, African uh, children, especially when associated with the virus Epstein-Barr virus. It may present you as this growth that may even also rate affecting um, the mandible. So most likely you would want to take a biopsy for histopathology and you're going to see a starry sky appearance. Uh, other investigations that you want to order, of course, are a complete blood count or full blood count, a liver function tests, as well as urea, electrolytes, and creatinine, because also for the sake of the chemotherapy that you're going to give the child. So I want to do a, a, a cross match in case the child may need blood. And then, of course, a CT scan to stage um, the tumor. Then how would you treat the child, of course, with chemotherapy and one um, complication is what is known as tumor lysis syndrome. So this is usually a complication of chemotherapy or radiotherapy, especially with very large tumors. Remember that chemotherapy or radiotherapy are targeted at killing these cells that are uh, dividing out, out of control. So when these cells are killed, they release all their substances into their bloodstream. And so there may be hypocalcemia. And this makes sense that if tissue is dying, calcium usually likes to deposit where tissue is dying. So think of it like calcium depositing in the death of this tissue as you're killing off the cells with chemotherapy. So there will be a hypocalcemia. Hy hyperuricemia because of the cell products that are being released into the bloodstream. Same thing with hypokalemia and hyperphosphatemia. So those are the metabolic um, disorders. And how we prevent this, we usually hydrate the patients prior to chemotherapy as well as uh, give them allopurinol to block the formation of um, uric acid. So station 10, it's never um, an OSCE station if the station uh, misses in pediatrics. So study the image shown on your screen. What is the most likely diagnosis? Classify the causes and give one pathology in each. What are the clinical features of this condition? What other body what other parts of the body would you like to examine? What is your differential diagnosis? So I'll give you a two second interval to think through this baby that appears super cute here on the left okay so the last station is indeed hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus however you want to 
uh, pronounce it as long as you can spell it like this then um, classify the causes and give one pathology so you could classify it etiologically as congenital versus acquired or you could classify it as obstructive versus non-obstructive or communicating versus non-communicating so if you're classifying it as congenital you could have stenosis of the cerebral equiduct so meaning that you prevent the flow of CSF in through the cerebral equiduct. And then of course you may have a dandy walker malformation which uh, um, is also associated with some blockage. Then you may also have acquired conditions such as infections like a TB meningitis or posterior fossa tumors such as gliomas. So remember in dandy walker malformation sometimes you may have uh, an absence of um, the cerebellar vermis that may also be associated with the posterior um, wall um, cyst in the fourth ventricle most commonly if i'm not mistaken um, so a posterior wall cyst in the ventricles then what are the clinical features of this condition so you may have an increase in a head circumference remember a child roughly has a head circumference of roughly about 35 centimeters when they are born then the sutures may be split so wide splitting of the sutures the child may have some sunset eyes because of compression of the uh, upward gaze centers that are present inside um, the brainstem you may also have impaired levels of consciousness you may have dilated scalp vessels you may have a crackpot sound on percussion of the head and which other parts of the body would you want to examine the spine of course because there may be some spinal defects what is your differential diagnosis you could either have a chondroplasia you could have familial macrocephaly or cretinism so remember the other possible um question they could ask you is about the treatment so usually uh, we treat the underlying cause a medical treatment especially for things like um, TB and then for things like tumor the wood tumors that would require some surgical intervention you may also want to perform some shunts where you could actually shunt the CSF it could be um, a ventricular uh, peritoneal shunt where you shunt the, uh, the CSF from the ventricles or from the flow in uh, the ventricles to um, the peritoneal cavity. Sometimes it could even be a ventricular uh, pleural uh, type of shunt. And usually those uh, procedures have their complications, which we shall look at in uh, the other episodes of these OSCE series. So thank you for taking your time to uh, listen to this um, episode on pediatrics. Please stay tuned for episode four. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Share, drop a comment, drop a like. Do not